Hey everyone, welcome to a new episode of my vlog. Uh, today is going to be another rock and roll history episode. Uh, I've already done a couple. I did like a half hour set list analysis of, of, of Paul McCartney's shows. I've done like another half hour long video about the history of the Temptations and all of their various lineup changes. So by now you probably know that I have a ton of rock and roll history information that until I had this vlog was kind of uselessly sitting around in my head. Uh, but when it comes to KISS, I'm on a whole another level. I've been a KISS fan since I was 10 years old, and I've been slowly accumulating facts and figures and histories of the band. So, if I, I, I've been thinking about how to do this video on KISS history on this channel. I just feel like I know too much to just do one video about like just a, a rundown on what they've done in their career. So I'm actually going to go year by year. I at least want to cover every year of the 70s. Don't worry, I'm not going to do this every day. I'm going to probably do this once every couple of weeks. I'll do a new video on KISS if I have an off day. But today we're going to start at the very beginning. And that is the glorious year of 1973. Fun fact, when I was in elementary school, I had to choose a four-digit uh, student number. And I chose 1973 based on the fact that I was already a huge KISS fan. <laughs> um, I'm actually going to start a little earlier than 73. I'm going to also cover some of the stuff they did in 71, 72, just to give you some background on how the band got started. And I'm going to stop yapping and get right into it since I already, since I don't want this to be too uh, grotesquely long of a video. So in about 1971, there was a band in New York City called Wicked Lester. That band was com was comprised of uh, Gene Klein, Stanley Eisen, and three other members. Uh, throughout 71 and 72, they spent about a year recording an album for Epic Records, who had signed them in, I believe, the summer of 71. Uh, so they spent a year working on this album, which especially in the early 70s is bizarre. Even the most, uh, the most successful bands of the time were not spending a year to make their albums. The reason it took Wicked Lester so long is because they weren't really sure of what they were doing. Their original name was called Rainbow before they were asked to change their name by another band called Rainbow, which interestingly enough wasn't even Richie Blackmore's Rainbow, so I don't know what became of that band. But they called themselves Rainbow because they played such a wide variety of music. They were doing folk tunes and rock tunes and pop tunes. They couldn't really decide what they were. So they spent a year trying to rein in exactly what it was that they were. In spring of 1972, one of a couple of things happened. It's often hard to know exactly what happens in Kiss's history as uh, Gene Simmons and Paul Stanley in their interviews, uh, they talk like politicians. They really do have a rhetoric to try to make themselves into this, uh, it, this incredible legendary story of their career. And it's hard to tell how much of the stuff they say is true, or their skewing of the facts over the years. If you ask Gene and Paul what happened in the spring of 1972, was that they looked at the album they'd recorded, didn't like it, and despite having a major record label, decided to walk away from Epic Records and start again, firing the other band members. But through looking at other people's interviews and stuff, what it's pretty clear actually happened was that they submitted their record to Epic Records, and they were like, Really? You guys took a year to come up with this garbage and scrapped the entire album and kicked them off the label entirely. And Gene and Paul were left saying, what do I do now? I think that's closer to what actually happened. Uh, in any case, uh, Gene and Paul, who at the time were Gene and Stanley, uh, decided to keep going, just the two of them and form a new band that was in a much more hard rock style. Uh, they were fans of Zeppelin and Sabbath at the time, and they wanted to create like a heavy hard rock band. They were also in the early 70s in New York City, which was super glam rock, so they, 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 they took their image very seriously. Even from day one, they always every decision they made was, had something to do with their image and deciding, is this right for us? Um, so the first thing they decided to do when they ventured out on their own was to uh, was was to get they needed a drummer obviously neither of them could play the drums so they put out an ad uh, for a drummer wanted 
and they left their phone number and they got several phone calls. One of the phone calls was from a guy by the name of Peter Criscola. Um, and he, apparently he was at a party and he was talking to some friends of his when he made the call and uh, got some of his friends who were just at the party with him to shout out answers to questions that Gene and Paul were asking him. They were asking him stuff like, uh, do you consider yourself good looking? And so he got his friends to be like, yeah, you are. And like, are you a good drummer? Yeah, he is. He's amazing. And so he got his friends to kind of back him up, which is funny. But apparently he they asked tons of questions right down to what would you do? Would you wear a dress on stage if it meant be successful? And Peter was just like, yeah, I guess. I don't have anything better to do. It's also worth noting that Peter was in a couple of other bands at that time as well and had like a six or seven year history of gigging with local bands and folk and rock and jazz. He, he had quite a diverse background at that point. And even at the time that he was looking to join this new band, he was in another band that curiously enough was called Lips. Wonder if Kiss took any, uh, took, took, took any direction from that on where to name their bands. Very similar. Um, but nonetheless, they, they, they did, a. Uh, an audition. Peter did an audition and they liked him and asked him to join the band. He said yes and it was shortly after that that they decided we got to change our names. That's right they were so focused on their image that they thought even like they wouldn't get bookings based on their names. They thought like Gene Klein, Stanley Eisen, those don't sound like cool American rock and roll names. So Gene Klein becomes Gene Simmons. Uh, Stanley Eisen changes his name. He flips his first name to become his last name and becomes Paul Stanley. And probably at the request of Gene and Paul, Peter Criscola shortens his name to Peter Chris. And they become a power trio that rehearses at their Bleecker Street loft in New York City uh, for several months. Uh, and it culminates in November with a... Uh, they, they put on a showcase for some local industry people and it goes pretty poorly, and no one calls them back. And uh, after their poor showing, they talk amongst themselves, and they're like, okay, we need a, 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 a guitarist. We need a lead guitarist. Paul has said in interviews that at the time, when it came time for a guitar solo in their songs, Paul would just have to play chords, because he didn't know he wasn't very good at soloing. Um, so they put, out, uh, they put out an advertisement in the Village Voice newspaper, uh, they wanted the ad to read, lead guitarist wanted with flash and balls, but they would not print that in a, in a magazine in 1972. So they were forced to change it to lead guitarist wanted with flash and ability. Um, they got a, quite a few responses and a few people came in to audition. And after the auditions were done, Gene and Paul were sitting there trying to decide which one of them was best. And apparently, this is after the auditions had already finished, some drunk guy walked in off the street uh, with one red sneaker and one orange sneaker, just plugged into the amp and started playing. And they were like, dude, we're done here. You're, what are you doing here? You gotta go home. What? You're being weird. And so he was like, no, I just don't want to play. I want to audition. And so, long story short, that guy was Paul Fraley, a.k.a. Ace Fraley. Uh, as legend has it, they ripped into the song Deuce, uh, which would become their live opener for years. Um and liked what he was doing soloing to the song so much that they decided to hire him. They, I, I believe they hired him around Christmas time of 1972, and suddenly the band was whole. And they also, speaking of names, I mentioned that the other three all changed their name. His name was Paul Fraley. Paul Stanley, even though Paul was not his first name at all, said, look, can't have two Pauls in the band. I don't think that'll work. You can't be Paul. What name do you want to be called? And he says... Why don't you call me my uh, nickname? Call me Ace. He said, friends called him Ace because he was an ace with the ladies, apparently. So Paul was like, Ace Fraley? That's pretty cool. So they became Gene Simmons, Paul Stanley, Ace Fraley, and Peter Chris, but they didn't have a band name yet. They were uh, brainstorming band names at some point in this time, and... Uh, Apparently, Peter Chris wanted to call the band the F word. They wanted something short. They wanted something like three or four letters, short, quick, to the point, something people would remember. Which I don't think there are any band names left that are really short like that, unless they're completely obscure these days. It's so hard to find a band name. But back in 1972, perhaps it was a little easier. They couldn't really come up with anything. 
But uh, then eventually someone, and it could have been Peter, it could have been Paul, no one's really sure. The, the stories differ as to who suggested the name the last time, but they came up with the name Kiss and they all stopped and they thought, wow, that's actually not bad. And so they went with that and continued rehearsing and they booked themselves a weekend of gigs at the local uh, pub in Queens, New York called The Popcorn, which the week they performed for the first time changed its name to The Coventry. Now that pub no longer exists. Unfortunately, it would be a haven for Kiss fans to come visit now, but it uh, closed down in the 80s or 90s. Um, actually earlier, I don't think it survived the 70s even. Uh, but so on a Thursday, Friday, and Saturday night, beginning on January 30th, 1973, that's right, I've memorized all these dates, um, they played their first ever performance in front of people. No pictures. Actually, there might be a couple of pictures. I think a couple of pictures from the show exist, but no audio or video, certainly. Uh, but what they've said in interviews is the first time they ever performed on that uh, Thursday night at the Coventry no one showed up, like two or three people showed up, and by the end of the week, they never got more than like a half dozen people to attend the gigs. And they went so poorly that Peter Chris actually, after that, was like, I'm in another band. We're actually getting bookings where people will show up playing top 40 tunes, so I'm out. He left the band, and apparently they had to spend the better part of a month trying to track him down and convincing him, please rejoin the band, and he eventually did. And so then in March, they booked couple more gigs, another weekend of gigs at another equally easy to book, not quite so popular venue on Long Island in the town of Amityville, New York, and this place was called the Daisy. Daisy, the Daisy survived a lot longer and was a mecca for Kiss fans until I believe it burned to the ground in the early 2000s, unfortunately. But, uh, so they played a couple of shows at the Daisy, which went marginally better. Now, it was at those shows at the Daisy that they started to... Uh, they started to try new looks. And by new looks, I mean Gene started putting these black splotches of makeup around his face. Not in the famous design he has now, but just like a, a big splotch. Uh, just And uh, I don't even think he was doing the white face thing yet. He may have started to. Um, I know all Paul was doing in these really early days was putting like rouge on his face. He, he didn't do the white face yet. But slowly but surely, their image was coming together over the months of 1973, and they were starting to decide what they wanted to wear on stage. They didn't have any formal costumes yet, but they were starting to get their act together, so to speak. Um, and throughout April and May and June, they were playing the, com the, the, uh, the Coventry fairly regularly, playing the Daisy fairly regularly, and they were opening for other local New York scene bands at the time and starting to get a decent little local following going. Uh, the bands they were opening for at that time were bands called like the Brats and uh, the New York Dolls who went on to a, to, to a fair amount of fame actually were frequently on the bill with Kiss in these early concerts. Um, and it was at this time that certain things that they would become famous for in their stage shows were developing. They had a song called Firehouse which is known in later years for being the song Gene Simmons breathes fire to. But uh, in the early days, they had a bucket full of confetti. And at the end, he'd be like, I have some water for the fire. And he'd go to throw the bucket. And the fans would freak out like he's really throwing water on us, but it would just be confetti. It would have been cool to see footage of, but no footage exists of that one. But uh, yeah, and the arrangements for their songs were slowly coming together. Uh, there's a recording from, I want to say, June or July. Maybe it's August. No, August. A recording from August of 1973, one of Kiss's early performances at the Daisy, is available on YouTube, and it's the earliest uh, recording of Kiss performing live that exists anywhere, and it's a really cool insight to the way their songs sounded in the early days, because they, they hadn't quite settled on their famous um, uh, arrangements of their songs. Some of them uh, were, you know... So, some of the songs were much longer and they would have like an extended jam in the middle that would eventually be cut. It's interesting to listen to some of those old tunes. Now, by July, they were happy enough with their arrangements and their stage show and their new... Uh, now, Paul was starting to wear makeup now and they were starting to get their individual personas uh, 
together. That's the cool thing about Kiss for me, is that they actually play characters, you know? It's not just Gene, Polly, St. Peter up there. It's the Spaceman, the Demon, the Star Child, and the, the, the Cat. And they already, by July, had those four personas down, and we're starting to use them. Uh, so on July 13th, they played their first feature... Uh, or they, 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 sorry, they put together a feature performance for some industry people like they had the previous November and put on their full show at the place called the Hotel Diplomat, which was in New York City and was a dive. It was a hotel that I think was like a hotel from the 1920s that was actually decent, but by the time Kiss played there in 73, there were holes in the floor and the place was like, should have been condemned. Apparently it was disgusting but it was the only place they could get to host an event like this. So they hosted it, made a big deal of it, even hired a bunch of their friends to show up and rush the front of the stage and scream. They hired like 40 or 50 people. Literally, I believe they paid them to come to the show and scream. <laughs> that's such a kiss move. I don't know why, but that strikes me as such a kiss move to hire. They're all very business oriented and how can we spend our money in a way that will increase our profits? And at this point, what it was is to hire 40 people to go cheer at the front of the stage, which is hilarious to me, but it's actually kind of ingenious. It makes it look like there's a real demand for this band. So they do this show, they feel good about it, and they don't hear back from any of these industry people. They don't get like one phone call, so they're like, oh, that's a shame. So what did they decide to do? They're just like, we'll do it again. So on August 10th, less than a month later, they host a second feature show. Uh, they brought more industry people in to see them, hired more of their friends to cheer for them in the crowd. And one of the people who came to that August 10th show was a guy by the name of Bill Coin. He was a television producer at the time. Uh, how that uh, relates to booking rock and roll acts, I'm not sure. But... He comes up after the show and he's like, you guys are great. I want to become your manager. I'll manage you guys. Uh, and it's going to be great. What do you say? And they were like, uh, Kiss, Kiss was not one of those bands who would look at a contract and be like, oh my gosh, you'll manage us? Oh boy, sure. They, they always had a bit of an arrogance to them for the very beginning. They always were just like, we are going to be the greatest band in the history of the universe. You know that. They had like a bit of a Beatles complex in that way. They were like, we're going to be the greatest. So... When Bill Coin came up to them and said, I'll be your manager, what do you think? They were like, you've never managed a rock band before. You can't just m m come up and manage us. Like, you have no experience in this. We're going to be a big deal, and it, we're not going to hire a manager unless we know that they're going to make us a massive success. <laughs> and he says, okay, guys, look, you guys don't have a manager. Tell you what, you don't even have to sign me. Uh... I will work for you for 30 days. If I can't find you guys a record deal in 30 days, I'll walk away. You'll go your separate way, I'll go mine, I'll deem it that it didn't work out. But he said, but here are my terms and conditions and whatever. If I find you a suitable record deal within 30 days, I be your manager. And they looked at each other and they're like, I guess we don't have anything to lose. We have nothing to lose. Ooh, no pun intended. Um, kind of pun intended. Kiss's first single was called Nothing to Lose. It was one of the songs they were playing in 1973. For those of you who don't know, if you don't know that, though, why are you even watching this? this is deep, in-depth history of Kiss. Um, but uh, anyway, <laughs> so they were like, that's a good idea. So about a month goes by. Kiss continues to gig locally. And in early September, Bill Coin comes back, and he's like, I did it. I got you guys a record deal. And they couldn't believe it. Um, and then they went in and they were like, wow, we have a record deal with a real record company? And he was like, kind of. It's a record company that's just been founded right now by Neil Bogart, who had formerly been an executive at Buddha Records and had just split from them to form his own label, which he was calling Casablanca Records, named after the 1940s movie. And... The Casablanca Records logo had Humphrey Bogart on it. It was weird. And it was run by a guy named Neil Bogart, who was of no relation to him. It's weird. It was a weird concept. And I guess, I guess the same thing happened. Kiss was like, but they're a brand new label. They have no... They have no artists. Like, 
they, they even have distribution? And he was like, yeah, they're working on a deal with Warner Bros. to have distribution. But they were like, you know what? We, we don't have any other leads on a record deal. We might as well take this. So they did. They signed to Casablanca Records. I think it was like a three-album deal. Um, I'm not quite sure about that. Let me know in the comments if you know what exactly their first record deal was. Or if I have any other inaccuracies in this video that you want to point out. Hey, you stupid moron, it's this. Kiss fans get a bit that way, so I will totally accept any uh, comments and feedback on this video in the description. Uh, but anyway, so they meet with Neil Bogart, or sorry, Bill Coin, their new de facto manager, and Neil Bogart have a meeting where he brings Kiss's demo tape. Totally forgot to talk about their demo tape. In April of 1973, Gene and Paul remembered that they were owed one day of studio time from way back in their Epic Records days at Electric Lady Studios. That's the studio where, uh, where Eddie Kramer worked as the engineer and had engineered a lot of Jimi Hendrix classic albums, and we did the Woodstock soundtrack. He was a big, big, big deal producer in, in 1973 even. And they were owed this one day. So the four of them went in, did basically one or two takes of five of their earliest songs. And Eddie Kramer did a really simple mix of them on just a four track recorder. And you know what? It's the whole demo can be found on YouTube and it's actually not bad. Eddie Kramer did a pretty good job putting those together. And Eddie Kramer would go on to be a big part of Kiss's history. He would go on to produce several albums for them, but that's for later videos. Um, but yeah, so they did have that demo. So when Neil Bogart, or sorry, when Bill Coyne was meeting Neil Bogart, he showed them this demo. He showed him this demo tape, and Bogart was like, "That's pretty cool. I like this. They got a, they got a good vibe." And Bill Coyne was like, "Yeah, right. So are you gonna sign them? Here's their promo picture." And Neil looks at this promo picture and goes. Why, why in God's name are they dressed like that? Why can't you just be musicians on stage? Why do you gotta dress like you're a clown? <laughs> and, okay, sp uh, just letting you know, this next part of the story feels like something Gene and Paul may have made up for posterity. They claim this happened, uh, that Neil Bogart took them in for a meeting and said, Look, I'll sign you right now as long as you guys promise to never put on that stupid makeup ever again. And Gene and Paul looked at each other. And they were like, no. No deal. We do it our way or not at all. And he was like, and he was like blown away that they said that. Um, and eventually was just like, okay. All right. You do you, man. So in September of 1973... Kiss signed their first record deal and were the first act ever to be signed to this brand new upstart Casablanca Records label, which due to the success of Kiss in the future years and a few other things and signings of some other major bands actually became kind of a big deal record label in the 1970s for a while. Um, that all flamed out as well, which I may discuss in these future videos. Um, but so... Kiss goes into Bell Sound Studios with producers uh, Kenny Kerner and Richie Wise in October and November of 73 to put together a new, or a debut, studio album. They had like 15 songs, which Kenny and Richie uh, whittled down to nine. Uh, it's also worth noting that Kenny, uh, Kenny Kerner and Richie Wise were not hard rock producers. They were pop producers, and they, to a degree, didn't really know what to do with Kiss weren't really able to capture their live sound. But the first studio album that they recorded in October of no October and November of 73 is still uh, pretty renowned as far as KISS fans go, but it's possibly due to the strength of the material, which KISS would go on to continue to perform live to this day. Uh, a lot of the songs from this first album KISS still play in concert on the end of the road tour they're doing right now. Um... But yeah, so they spent a good couple of months recording it, which is a far cry from the year they'd spent working on the Wicked Lester album. And then in December, uh, Kerner and Wise uh, spent most of that month mixing it. In the meantime, Kiss knew it was time to go out on tour and do real professional concerts. So they, uh, the record label booked them in 
to the biggest show by far that they had ever done. New Year's Eve 1973 into 74 at the Academy of Music in New York City, which is a venue that later became known as the Palladium, and then even later than that ceased to exist completely, uh, the Academy of Music. Uh, it seated just under 3,500 people. The headliners on that bill were Blue Oyster Cult. The bill also included Iggy and the Stooges, and I think a band called Teenage Lust as well. And buff and that was what the Marquet read, those three bands. Not even listed on the ticket were fourth billed, first band to go up on the stage that night, Kiss. Um, the record label gave them a decent budget for putting together a stage show, and they used it to buy a six-foot-tall, light-up KISS logo, <laughs> of course, and uh, new redesigned costumes, stage lighting, couple of neat pyro tricks as well, and Gene trained with a magician in the act of fi uh, fire breathing. Uh, they also got smoke machines and stuff, but yeah, the fire breathing during Firehouse was a big deal. Before they played that New Year's Eve show, though, they played a couple of shows at that club I was telling you earlier about the Coventry. Now, these were sort of... They were kind of farewell to the club days shows, but more than anything, they were just rehearsal shows to get their act together before they started to do these bigger professional events. In order to review the footage from these concerts... KISS actually uh, films these concerts. They tape them. And they uh, wound up in a storage locker until about 10 years ago, at which point they were, they were revealed and this incredible footage was found. And we still have a full tape from KISS's last ever show at the Coventry Club on December 22nd, 1973 which is astonishing, and it was featured as a bonus disc uh, to Kissology. Ladies and gentlemen, put your two lips together, because they're going to blow them away. Kiss! Kiss! <laughs> They did that, they reviewed the footage, and it was time for their New Year's Eve show at the Academy of Music. They were nervous, but they were excited. They hit the stage, and the audience was like, what on earth is going on right now? Uh, but during Firehouse, Gene goes out for the first time in front of a lot of people, he's gonna breathe fire, this is gonna be big, and he puts it too close to his face, and he singes his hair. He sets his hair on fire. This footage, there's no footage of this show, but this footage that I'm gonna show you right now is actually from a separate time that this incident happened in 1975. Doing this fire breathing trick, Gene has set his hair on fire several times. The audience, thinks it's part of the act, and is like, oh my god, that was amazing. The bassist sets himself on fire, how cool is that? Name another band where the bassist sets himself on fire in the middle of a concert. I don't know. Um, someone in the audience, thank you, whoever you are, actually had a, a recorder, um, not the irritating wind instrument, a big, giant, whatever the 1973 tape recorders looked like, and um, recorded Kiss's set in pretty awful quality audience recording, but still we have a recording of that concert. Um, and that set the stage for what was to come. And what was to come, I will explain in a future video, because we've reached the end of Kiss's activities in 1973. Kiss did a lot of really exciting things in 1974, which I'll talk about in my next video on this subject, which I'll probably do sometime next week or so. Uh, in 1974, Kiss put out two albums and spent pretty much the entire year on the road uh, as an opening act, slowly graduating into a headliner. We'll talk about all that in the next video. Thank you for sitting through this exhaustive history 
of the first year of the first full year of Kiss's career. Uh, for those of you who don't know, I'm also a professional musician myself, and uh, I do many shows across BC. Uh, and so check out my description for a full list of all my upcoming tour dates. Also, there's a link to my Bandcamp where you can pick up my albums Once I Thought and 2054. Now, you can get them for free of charge. You can also make a donation to me through that website if you'd like, and every dollar that I make just helps me get a little bit further uh, on my music career. I am a full-time professional musician. Uh, also, there's links to where you can find my album on iTunes and Spotify and wherever else uh, music is sold or streamed online. Like this video if you enjoyed what you saw, and uh, subscribe to my channel if you've been enjoying all of my videos, and also you can ring that notification bell if you do want to be notified every time I upload a new video, which will be tomorrow and every day uh, for the foreseeable future. Uh, thanks guys so much for watching. Had a blast making this video for sure. I'll catch you again with another awesome new vlog again tomorrow and a new Kiss History vlog in the next week or two. Thanks so much for watching part one of this crazy history of my favorite band. I'll catch you again tomorrow. Thanks for watching.